So my name is Megan Collins. I'm the research coordinator for CureGrin, and today we are joined by three fantastic researchers who are going to talk to us a little bit about functional testing and what that looks like. Our first presentation is going to be by Dr. Ian Combs. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Yeah, thanks very much, Megan. Okay, let's see if we can do this smoothly. Okay, can uh, is that is that coming through okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm Ian Coombs. I'm an electrophysiologist uh, working at University College London, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we can use expression systems to examine the properties of GRI variants to understand a bit more about them. I'm going to start just talking a little bit uh, generally about the technique and also um, some data that we've managed to produce uh, looking at a novel uh, GRI2 variant. And so uh, these expression systems, they're a really um, fast, efficient way of understanding really key biophysical details about the receptors, but it's actually the second step in the process. And, and the first step in the process is made an awful lot easier by the fact that we now have um, structural details of all of, the, of all of the glutamate receptors. So starting off with AMPA receptors back in 2009, uh, then there were some NMDA receptors, KNA receptors, and finally last year we have the first structure of a, a, grid, a grid receptor as well. And so when we find out the details of a variant, it's very easy for us to kind of plug that into these structures and work out exactly where they are and uh, exactly what they're likely to be doing. And uh, the reason we can also work out what they're likely to be doing is that not only do we understand the structure very well, we also understand uh, the mechanisms of how the, um, how the receptors work. So they sit here in the postsynaptic membrane, ready to catch glutamate released by the presynaptic cell. And when the glutamate's released, it binds within this central region within the AMPA receptor, the ligand binding domain. And when uh, this clamshell-like structure of the ligand binding domain closes, it pulls open uh, the channel pore. And it's this opening that produces the electrical signals in the brain. And it's also these electrical signals that we can um, examine using our expression systems. So, um, all of, the, all, of our, all of us researchers have all got all the uh, glutamate receptor genes in the fridge and they're stored within handy little units of DNA called plasmids. And these are circular little bits of DNA and they make it very easy for us to amplify the DNA, purify it out. And then ulti ultimately our goal is to use a process called transfection, which gets this plasmid DNA into um, our cell of choice. And then the cell's own machinery will uh, turn this DNA into, uh, into the glutamate receptors, which we can then examine. Um, another advantage of these plasmids is it makes it's very, very easy to manipulate them. So anytime we find out the details of a variant, we can make that specific change in the DNA we already have. And it really does only take um, potentially less than two weeks from finding out the, the name of the variant to discovering um, exactly what this does uh, to receptor function. So expression systems are incredibly useful. And once we've got these receptors on the surface of our cell, there's a couple of different ways we can uh, we can examine them. So a more traditional way of doing it would be uh, we, we put a glass electrode into the cell to record the electrical activity in that cell. And then we can just very slowly apply solution to the bar. And in this case, uh, this is in the case of an agonist like glutamate. And as the concentration increases, the current increases, and we can understand, um, we can then start to begin to understand details about how glutamate is activating the receptor. And we can also use these same systems to look at the effect of drugs, whether they be potentiators or, or inhibitors. And again, this can all be done very, very quickly once we find out the details of the variant. Now, um, <clears throat> the disadvantage of, of using this kind of approach is that this is not the way that the receptors in the brain see glutamate. They see it uh, very, very short transient um, events when uh, at the synapse glutamate is released. And glutamate is there and then gone in just a millisecond or just a few milliseconds. And so that uh, is not the kind of thing you can do with this. This is the kind of, this application takes seconds and minutes. Um, and so to get a better idea of exactly how the receptors are gonna behave in the brain, we do, um, we go to the same situation as this where we have access to the cell, but then we pull the electrode back. And what that allows us to do is get a tiny little bit of membrane on the end of our electrode. And because it's so small, uh, we can we have very good control over the the solutions that it uh, can experience, and uh, we use this device here, which has got two channels, so it's just a little glass tube. Um, and on one side we have a control solution, on the other side a glutamate solution, and that allows us to really examine exactly how the receptors might behave in the synapse, going from a situation where there's no glutamate at all to a very high concentration of glutamate and, and then back. 
and it's uh, it's this technique is the main technique that we use in the lab and this is how we uh, we, we, we we choose to examine the variance so um, when we first were were contacted by Curegrin and um, we we're kind of looking for a job almost um, the uh, in the first question and answer session we attended, uh, there was a question from a clinician about a particular variant in FLURA2, A643V, and they were wondering whether it was loss of function or gain of function. And this was going to dictate the, the approach they took for the patient. And so uh, we decided to have a look at it. And um, it was immediately obvious by going through the looking at the structural uh, data that this was very likely to be disease causing. So it was found in this um, completely conserved region of the glutamate receptors, this nine amino acid stretch. And it was this final alanine here that was changed to a valine. And we knew we know this is important because it's conserved. And this region is, um, in, is it's like the very, uh, it, it forms the channel gate. So basically this bit of the protein um, is, all, is all bunched together, the four copies, when the channel is closed. And when the channel opens, they all spring apart. And that's what opens the ion channel that allows us to record electrical currents. Um, and another reason we were kind of could be convinced that it was likely to be disease causing was that this for the amper receptors there's actually been a, another few uh, variants been identified at this exact site so for for GRIA1 um, a threonine was found at this site and for GRIA4 also a valine and so um, the th the threonine variant has been looked at at length and is known to be gain of function and while uh, it's likely that the valine was also gain of function uh, because uh, they're similar amino acids, they're the same size and shape, even though their chemistry is subtly different. But there were two main options. Either this valine could destabilize the closed receptor, causing gain of function, or it could stabilize it, uh, leading to loss of function. And uh, we, we made the variant in our plasmid, we expressed it into the expression system and pulled a patch, and it was immediately obvious that this variant was gain of function. So by using a very sh uh, brief pulse of glutamate, we can activate the receptor and then glutamate unbinds. And for the wild type receptor, this all happens within one millisecond. But for the variant, this was taking more like 10 milliseconds. Um, and that was equally the case in the presence of the important auxiliary subunits called the TARPs, where the deactivation was slowed to five milliseconds. Um, but then it was an additive effect with the variant, uh, giving a, a deactivation time constant of 60 milliseconds. And this is enormously uh, not how an amper receptor should, should behave. Um, it certainly would, would, is likely to indicate an increased affinity, affinity. It binds glutamate longer, so it will be able to bind lower concentrations of glutamate um, and give a larger response. And um, this is likely to uh, completely interfere with normal synaptic transmission. Okay, so we've we've kind of taken the structural information. We've we've made the gene. We've um, used the gain. We've used the expression system to find that it's gain of function. And so the next logical step that you can also do with these expression systems is to try and find a drug likely to, to um, counteract the uh, counteract the effect of the variant. So um, for amper receptors, the um, the, uh, the the only prescribable drug really, the only one that's widely in the clinic, is a negative allosteric modulator called Prantanil, which has the potential to uh, deactivate or to counteract the gain of function uh, changes. Um, and so to, to examine this, we, look, we looked at a slightly different application of, glut of glutamate. So uh, amper receptors and most ligand gated ion channels have a, a defense mechanism built in in case there's too, if in case the signal lasts too long and they can turn themselves off in the continued presence of, of glutamate. For the wild type receptor, this desensitization was over 99%. However, for the variant receptor, it was only about 50%. So again, not only is there a deficit in closure, deactivation was greatly delayed, desensitization is also, is also greatly affected. And this was uh, similarly amplified with the TARP. Um, and what we found when we applied parampanel was that parampanel could inhibit these currents. However, the inhibition was somewhat, somewhat modulated and somewhat less. So for the wild type receptor, a concentration of three micromolar parampanel um, inhibited currents by between 80 and 90%. However, for the variant, this inhibition was down um, around 40%. And so what this tells us is that while Prampanel is effective at inhibiting uh, the currents, this, uh, this inhibition is partial. And so um, and certainly you wouldn't design a drug like this. You would rather have it, you would rather it have um, a preferential effect on the variant, as we heard earlier from Dr. Zhang talking about Namantine and a, one of the Grin variants. Um, but this, so this is, uh, this is suboptimal. So we intend to look further and try and find other potential amperoceptor modulators that may have a greater effect on this variant. Um, uh, just to uh, further 
um, elaborate why it's important to do these kinds of tests. Uh, we also looked at the, the threonine variant, which is also known to be gain of, gain of function. But the effect of the threonine variant was even greater than van Valian. It seemed to be, it, it was a much uh, much greater gain of function. Uh, there was no desensitization at all in the absence, even in the absence of a tarp. And in the presence of the tarp, there was a, there was a very large leak current. So this channel remains open the whole time. And in actual fact, even in the presence of MBQX that should shut all the channels, uh, still 10% of the current remained when, when the tarp was there. So while th the threonine and the valine variants look very similar on paper, the actual um, manifestation of the, of, the, of the change on the channel was, uh, was appreciably different, even though both gain a function. Okay, and then uh, finally, just a, a bit of mechanism. Um, going back to our structure again, there's a structure of the receptor with parampanel bound. And uh, the site of the variant was immediately adjacent to this parampanel. And so any change here is likely to disrupt the parampanel binding site. And so it's very likely that this is the reason why parampanel was less effective against the variant. And, and further, the binding site only looks like this when the receptor is actually closed. As soon as the receptor opens, all of these bits around here move and parampanel will no longer bind. And that probably explains why, in the presence of the TARP at least, while there was a decent level of inhibition instantaneously, that inhibition decreased as, uh, as, as time passed. Okay, so just to summarize, we looked at, uh, we used expression systems to establish the nature of an amperoceptor variant, A643V, and found that uh, while it's, uh, the, this uh, gain of function was accentuated by the TARPs, um, how, and while parampanel can inhibit the variant, it seems to be less effective than against the, the healthy receptor. And what we intend to look at is other potential amperoceptor inhibitors, and also to examine the influence of parampanel on other gain of function variants to see whether this is a universal property of, of parampanel on gain of function. Okay, thank you, and thanks very much to the Medical Research Council and, and to the team at UCL and also the clinicians at University of Michigan. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Coombs. So now we are going to pass the presentation over to Dr. Walmuth, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. So I'm gonna talk again, sort of following up on Ian's uh, conversation, but talking about functional evaluation of, of NMDA, disease-associated NMDA receptor uh, variants. So again, as, as, as Ian sort of laid out, you know, an individual is identified with a missense mutation in a GRIN1, or a GRIN gene. Uh, again, I'm focusing on NMDA receptors. We express this variant in heterologous expression systems and we test function. And again, what's our goal? Our goal is to sort of identify whether it's a loss of function, whether this variant is causing a loss of function, that is the protein doesn't work as well as it did before, or it's a gain of function, that is, it works too, too well. It's, it's, it works too well. And correspondingly, then, we want to bring in pharmacology, um, either positive allosteric modulators to enhance the function of the loss of function uh, variant or negative allosteric modulators to reduce the, reduce the activity of these gain of function. And again, our goal is, is hopefully to normalize some of the function of the NMDA receptor, which in turn could... Uh, normalize some of the uh, uh, behavior and activity of the individual affected by this. Now the challenge again, and there's many of them, um, but one of them is that NMDA receptors have really a complex uh, array of properties. So these are the properties that control their function at synapses. And so it's often difficult to define an NMDA receptor as loss or gain of function. That in, and oftentimes these variants will produce in one parameter a gain of function and another a loss of function. So it's, it's oftentimes difficult to define the appropriate pharmacology. And even if you define a variant as loss of function or gain of function, it's sometimes challenging to, you know, to what to normalize. Again, what we want to do is to maximize normalizing this function. So one of the things we've been trying to work on is to, is, is to de develop an approach that can characterize these variants that requires a limited number of measurement, but also captures aspects of the physiology, right? We wanna, we wanna capture the, this approach to capture the physiology of NMDA receptors. And then from this approach, these measurements we're gonna make, we want to generate some consolidated parameters. So again, these consolidated parameters are gonna contain a lot of information about these different biophysical properties, but they're gonna contain it into one or two values, which will aid in allowing us to define them as loss or gain function. And then finally, we wanna use these consolidated parameters 
to help us guide the pharmacology. What sort of, what sort of, um, you know, pharmacology can we use to normalize these? To again, to maximize normalizing function. So again, we're using a, it's a three-step process. There's lots of steps in between that I'm not going to go into. So we're going to use pulses of glutamate to assay ion channel gating, and I'll discuss this in a moment. And then we're going to assay voltage dependence of magnesium blocks. So again, these two steps here encompass a lot of properties of, of the NMDA receptor. And we're going to do this three-step process here. And from these combination factors, we're going to derive a charge transfer. Um, the step three, we're going to assay calcium influx using, like, again, and then from that, we're going to be able to drive a calcium transfer. Now, it, it, for NMDA's receptors at synapses, there's, you know, it, it, there's two prominent roles they carry. One is a charge transfer, and this is their role in, uh, in, in regulating membrane excitability. And another key physiological role of NMDA receptors is this calcium transfer. So again, we're going to derive two terms that describe charge transfer and calcium transfer. And again, then our goal is to use pharmacology, the appropriate pharmacology to normalize this. And again, with all experiments I'm gonna show are with HEC-293 cells. We're doing experiments with human gluN1 and human gluN2A. And we've selected a subset of variants, GRIN1 and GRIN2A variants that um, are associated with epilepsy, some level of epilepsy. So I guess I got to stop, and I'm going to restart it. So one of the, for step one, what we're doing is we're using actually pulses of glutamate. So again, a, a, what we're doing here is we've, we're recording in the whole cell mode, and we're applying synaptic-like pulses here, very brief applications of glutamate to um, the, the, this. In this case, it's gluN1 and gluN2A. And um, we're looking at, at these pulses, these currents, and you can see there's various current amplitudes, they decay. But what we're interested in deriving here is the gray, this current integral, which is the charge. And so why are we doing it this way? Well, first of all, these pulses have physiological relevance, right? So at a synapse, NMDA receptors, as well as AMPAs, rarely see just a single pulse of glutamate, but rather they're going to see some pattern of of presynaptic activity that reflects the, the activity of the presynaptic neuron as well as uh, the release probability. So again, this charge or this current integral here captures uh, you know, a physiological component of NM a dynamic NMDA receptors. I'm not going to go in detail, but it also turns out that this charge also captures a lot of all the biophysical properties of NMDA receptors. So a lot of the physiological functions of NMDA receptors are captured by this single term. Again, sorry, I got it. So here's just, here are, this again, this is wild type. It's just showing um, the response of wild type to these Pulses, and here's just two example variants that, that I'm showing you. One is D552E, and you can see that in response to similar pulses like this, that the area under the curve is reduced. This variant, in terms of this parameter, is a loss of function. It cannot carry out this function as well as NMDA receptors, whereas this variant, N614S, actually shows a gain of function in terms of this in terms of this parameter. But again, what's important to realize is that, is that these, that within here, this contains, that integral term there, contains a lot of information, contains the gating properties as well as relative membrane expression. So again, you but that, again, is only part of, I'm going to skip a slide just because I'm jumping in and out here. But that's only part of how the NMDA receptor is regulated at synapses. So, uh, and the, another part is the voltage dependence of magnesium block. So, again, here's just wild type. This is a hallmark of NMDA receptors that they're modified, that they're charged, that the, what they carry 
through the membrane at synapse is regulated by magnesium, and you can see that a variant affects us. Again, this is a single property, and here's all these variants that we've looked at, a large number of these variants, we see that you know, some of them are gain of function and some of them are loss of function. Again, you don't have to worry about the absolute numbers because we're using this little color-coded chart here to indicate loss and gain of function. But again, this just reflects one of the parameters, right? Magnesium block. And what's important is not just magnesium block, but all those other gating parameters that I talked about before when we measured that integral. So then what we're able to do is, is take those gating parameters, we were able to put it into a modeled current now. We take the magnesium block parameters that we showed, so we're able to consolidate those all down into this sort of area under the curve here. And that area under the curve is what we refer to as the charge transfer. Again, it encompasses variations in current amplitudes it encompasses re receptor gating, and it encompasses magnesium blocks. So again, we have this one term, charge transfer, that encompasses all these factors. And again, here's just two examples of, of two variants, um, M641I, which is a gain of function, and N641S, which is an extremely large gain of function. And so, then the third step is we assay calcium influx under uh, using fractional calcium currents. It doesn't really matter. Again, we can derive then for the individual variants at a particular membrane potential, their effect on this ability to carry calcium. And, um, but again, what we want to do is to integrate this, this calcium influx over a wide voltage range and with magnesium block and with with um, all of the gating parameters. And so that's what's illustrated here. So again, this is the pulses and in light gray here, you can see that the charge transfer. So that would be the sort of the impact of the, of the NMDA receptor on membrane excitability. And then this darker gray is a calcium transfer. And um, and again, the, the, those two terms, but now again, this is only at one voltage. And so we're able to, again, using model currents to be able to drive the current under here as a term reflecting the charge transfer and here reflecting the calcium transfer. So again, for each of the of wild type and each of the variants, we can get a, a, these individual parameters to look at them. And again, here's just a summary of that. Again, you don't have to worry about the detailed numbers because you can just look at the loss and gain of function color scheme here. But we can see here's wild type for the charge transfer. Here's, here's wild type for the calcium transfer. And you can see we have loss and gain of functions. In some instances, we have no effect. And, it, and again, but these terms are encompassing a lot of the different properties of NMDAs. So now we just have this these two single terms. And as a last slide, again, now the global goal is to be able to take the pharmacology, either these negative allosteric modulators or the positive allosteric modulators, to modulate NMDA receptor function to return it back to sort of a normal level. So again, here's this is showing the pulses for wild type. Um, and you can see when we put on this NAM, this negative allosteric modulator called dextrofan, you can see it inhibits the function. And it does the same thing for these two variants here. But recall, these two variants here are gain of function. So their activity is greater than that of wild type. So again, so in the scheme down here, we want to normalize. So this is wild type. So this is what we're trying to get everything to, either for the charge transfer or for the calcium transfer. Again, these are gain of functions in terms of that. And you can see for at, at least at this concentration, we can get N614 back down to sort of that normalized level um, there, okay? And I, I'm gonna stop sharing.
this, this was um, a very painful way to give a presentation and I apologize for um, somehow not having my PowerPoint working right. Chaos worked, so it's, it, it, it did work. And I apologize, um, but I'm gonna stop sharing and let Graham take over now. Okay, thank you. Can you see my presentation? Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Megan, Denise, and Keith for inviting me to talk. Uh, I was asked to talk about mouse models of grin disorders. I'm going to focus on the one that we have been studying as an example, but the principles will apply, although the details will differ for all of the different NMDA, AMPA, and K8 receptor uh, variants. So our story started when I attended a GRIN meeting in Toronto three years ago, uh, and I met uh, Bryson and his parents, and, and Keith asked, is there anything we can do to help understand what could be the origin of the variant that is affecting his, his son, Bryson? Um, they, it was already identified as a point mutation, a de novo point mutation in the GRIN1 gene, a G620R substitution. And I had been in Toronto for a few years and realized that we actually had a fantastic mouse facility, the National Center for Phenogenomics, which is very good at making mouse models of human disorders. So I said that I thought there was a good chance that the TCP could make a mouse model. And indeed, fortunately, they were able to come through and they, they made a single point mutation in the GRIN1 gene, substituting uh, G for R, glycine for arginine. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we have done with this mouse, but of course the same could be done for any mouse model, it's just the outcomes would be of course different depending on the impact of the variants. So the first thing we found is that the mice were born. Um, we never, and to this date, we have never seen a homozygous mouse, which means that it's almost certainly embryonic lethal if you carry two copies of the variant. Um, but the heterozygous mice are born normally. This of course is the equivalent of the uh, human condition. Um, but they are lighter, they have a lower body mass, um, as you can see, and actually this is a wild type and this is the litter mate carrying uh, one copy of the, of the uh, variation. And this is the, they, they grow, they seem to be totally viable, but they are definitely uh, of smaller uh, body weight. The sorts of things we can do is we can remove parts of the brain and study their physiology. In principle, we could do this to any part of the brain. In reality, we study the hippocampus. We study the hippocampus because it's particularly important for learning and memory, which is one of the uh, um, cognitive domains that are affected in many of these grin variations. And also the hippocampus is an area we know more about than any other part of the brain. So it serves as a good model for the brain. Uh, we can look at the anatomy and we have seen no gross anatomical differences in, in our mice. They appear identical to wild type mice at the level that we have analyzed. And then we can make these electrophysiological recordings. We typically take isolated slices of hippocampus, the so-called hippocampal slice preparation. We can position the electrodes to stimulate afferent inputs and we can record from individual or populations of cells such as here we're stimulating so-called CA3 primal cells recording from the CA1 primal cells. So um, as we've heard in the previous talks, um, the NMDA receptors are very important. Uh, they're at synapses and they mediate uh, calcium entry and also charge transfer into the cell. But there are also AMP receptors present at the synapse. And most synapses in the brain, including the synapse we work on, essentially operates by uh, fast transmission working via the AMP receptors and under certain conditions, the NMDA receptors become engaged where they trigger changes in the efficacy of the synapses. That is, they cause learning and memory to happen. So we have studied both AMPA transmission and NMDA receptor mediated transmission at these synapses. The first take home message is that AMPA receptor mediated synaptic transmission is identical as far as we can see. We do not see any differences. And that is really good news because that means that the synapses have developed normally. The connectivity as far as we can tell in the absolutely normal. Even though they have had a, uh, an impaired NMDA receptor function, this has not impacted on the way that the synapses have developed. However, the NMDA receptor mediated synaptic transmission uh, is reduced, dramatically reduced. In fact, it's about 50% 
uh, of, of its normal size. There are special tricks that I don't really have time to go into to explain how we can isolate these NMDA receptor mediated synaptic responses, because normally they are blocked by magnesium, as we heard in the, in the last talk. But if we remove the magnesium or lower the magnesium, then we can record these responses. So this is exactly what one might expect if you have a problem with the NMDA receptor and it's a loss of function. If it was a gain of function, then these responses would be bigger. So this is pointing to a functional loss of function of this variation. So in terms of what NMDA receptors do, they're normally being blocked by magnesium. They're not being active most of the time, but during periods of intense activity, the sort of activity that is now going on through everybody's brains as they're listening to me speak, I hope, is that you get transient activity, you remove the magnesium block, the NMDA receptors get, become transiently activated and they cause persistent changes in how well those synapses operate. That is to say, the synapses are learning uh, from their past experience. Because there is a reduction in function of the NMDA receptors, we would predict that this learning process is reduced. And the way that we and others study that is through a process known as long-term potentiation. And what we do is we study amp receptor mediated transmission, which is pretty constant with time, deliver a brief period of high frequency stimulation to mimic the learning episode. And this leads to this long lasting increase in the size of the synaptic response. This is the so-called long-term potentiation or LTP. In the mice, this LTP is still present. So these synapses will still have the capacity to learn, but as you can see, it's dramatically reduced. And again, it's about a 50% reduction in the synaptic efficacy. We can then go one step further and try and understand the underlying mechanisms of this effect. So this is the take home message, LTP is reduced in, these, in the mice. In terms of the underlying mechanism, a reduction in function could be because there are less of the normal receptors at synapse, or it could be that there's the same number of receptors, but if they have a G620R variant, they are working less effectively, both of which would lead to a reduction in function. One way we've addressed this is to exploit one of the properties that have been identified previously using the hex cell type of recording that the previous speakers were talking about. This is from the Steve Trinellis lab, where they looked at the same variant and showed that in the hex cell expression system, you lose sensitivity to magnesium ions, which means if the synapses, if the receptors are getting the synapse, they should have altered magnesium sensitivity. But if they're not getting the synapse, then the magnesium sensitivity should be the same as in the wild type. And indeed, it's the latter case that we see. We've looked at the size of the synaptic response. This is the NMDA receptor mediated synaptic response. We slowly increased the magnesium concentration from 30 micromolar to one millimolar. And we've compared the potency of magnesium to suppress the NMDA receptor responses in wild type, which is in black, and in the variant, which is in blue. And as you can see, these are identical which tells us that it's not this situation, it's this situation. We're getting fewer receptors to the synapse, but the ones that we're getting there are behaving normally, as if the, the mutant receptors are probably getting broken down and not getting incorporated in the synapse. So that's good, because that means if we can boost the function of these receptors, then we can start to think about getting restoration of function. So we've in fact tried to do this using a number of drugs. Um, the one I'm going to show you is memantine. We use memantine because it's clinically approved uh, NMDA receptor channel blocker. You would expect it to be more effective in our gain of function, but when we did these experiments, it wasn't certain that it was a gain of function because, of course, the lack of magnesium sensitivity could actually point to a, a gain of function. Uh, and uh, Bryson had actually been treated with memantine. Um, under normal conditions, memantine at a therapeutic concentration has very little effect on LTP. Uh, the reduced LTP unfortunately wasn't boosted with memantine. In fact, if anything, the reduced LTP was further reduced by memantine, suggesting that memantine would not be effective in this case. And indeed, what we would expect is that the most effective treatment here would be a positive allosteric modulator. And that is something we're now about to go on and investigate. Uh, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm just going to show you one last approach. And that is because these are living animals before we sacrifice them to take the slices, we can actually use some of the other mice to do behavioral experiments. And we've just started to do a behavioral phenotype of our mice. And one thing we've noticed is that the G620R um, heterozygous mice uh, have le less activity. Uh, and so this is tracking the activity of a mouse 
uh, automatically as it's wandering around an open space. Uh, and as you can see, the variants are moving far less, and this is the quantification of the behavior. Uh, and they tend to walk more slowly, and they have impaired motor coordination. In addition, they have a number of repetitive behaviors, which are autistic-like to the extent you can get an autistic mouse. So you have an increase in repetitive behaviors, uh, increase in grooming, you have an increase in sniffing. And there's probably many other differences. We've, we, we haven't had the colony that long to look at everything, but we intend to look at learning and memory, anxiety, pain sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm aware that I'm out of time, so I've had to go through that very quickly. But the main principle is these sorts of methods can be applied to any of the variants. We just have to be able to make the mouse in the first place. So I just want to thank the people who have been involved in this work. Um, the work I've described has mainly been done by Patrick Tidball and Jin Yol Lee uh, with contributions from all these other people. And I should highlight Laurel Nutter, who is the person at TCP who was able to create the mouse for us. Uh, the funding mainly come from uh, Canadian government funding through the uh, CIHR funding. Thank you very much. Thank <music> you.